to welcome Lynn Komorowski to this afternoon's conversation. So, you know Lynn as the CEO of the Cleveland Cavaliers, but Lynn has his other responsibilities. The Monsters, the Canton Charge, the Cavs Legion Gaming Club, Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse, and the Cleveland Gladiators. Just a few different hats that he wears in addition to being a principal in Jack Entertainment. So he joined the Cavs as president in 2003. He came to us from the Philadelphia Eagles, with our Lumberjacks, and prior to that, the Minnesota Timberwolves. Here in Cleveland with the Cavaliers, he has established a, a truly collaborative culture and delivered to us, yes, the greatest moment in sports in decades in Cleveland, a 2016 championship. Applause all around for that. But I understand from Councilman Bracatelli that that moment might even be overshadowed by being Grand Marshal of the Polish Constitution Day Parade on Fleet Avenue in, in Slavic Village. So clearly you can tell that Len wears many, many hats. He gives back in a big way to our Cleveland community through the Greater Cleveland Partnership, Downtown Cleveland Alliance, Destination Cleveland, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and United Way, where he serves on all of those boards. He is the proud father of four very accomplished young people and an alum of Leadership Cleveland 2005. Len, welcome to the conversation, and we look forward to hearing from you. Great, Marianne. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction, and, and thanks for all your leadership with uh, the Leadership Center. And also, Marianne is a terrific neighbor, I will tell you that as well. So her and her husband, Tim, and her, they're great. You have a great crew to be proud of as well. Uh, amazing what they've accomplished. So, uh, uh, you, you know, speaking of these uh, unique times, and, and by the way, a shout out to Tony. That was an experience, Tony. I was glad to enjoy that with my whole family. And I'm, I'm always, uh, I have a soft spot in my heart for Slavic Village uh, with the Polish heritage that we have, but I'm amazed at how the progress you make on a daily ba basis with your leadership there in the community. Um, so with these unique times, I'm actually calling you in here from the bubble in Orlando. So I'm here with our uh, general manager, Kobe Altman, along with uh, his chief of staff, Jason Hillman. So we'll be, uh, so I will tell you this, I've already had, uh, I had a PCR test. Anybody have one of those yet? Raise your hand if you had. They stab your brain uh, down at the Walker Center on Euclid with Cleveland Clinic. And I just had two tests today. So I had, you have to have it before you come down here, then you get tested every day while you're here even though the PCR test here is much kinder, uh, and, and uh, then they have a rapid test, they call it as well. So with, with all that they've had going on down there, they have yet to have a positive test in the NBA bubble here. So we're at the Wide World of Sports down in Disney in Orlando, and uh, amazing setup. You know, so we have everything self-contained. We have three different sports venues. We have hotels. Uh, they have all the amenities with this, and you have the NBA community down here. Uh, so we are not one of the, um, so when Rudy Gobert tested positive on March 11, it seemed like the whole world stopped, if you think nationally, and about how that cadence, uh, that domino effect that occurred there. So our league decided, we went through a whole process, where there were 17 games to go in the regular season. They did a process where they determined that at that point in time, with 17 games to go, the most a team had ever come back was five games out of the playoffs or the eighth position. And so they went one more game, six out, 22 teams qualified into that realm. And so those 22 teams are here playing uh, eight games, and then they're going to have playoffs starting actually next week. We're one of the eight that didn't qualify. We're working on, uh, you know, August 20th comes up with the lottery again. So we're crossing our fingers again as far as that goes. But uh, we're still working on having basketball activity for the, for the eight teams as well. So... Uh, the good news is with the league, people are <clears throat> excited about basketball being back to ratings are actually up 15%. Despite the volume of games and the 6.30 start times and all of that, uh, people are tuning in and they're excited about sports being back. Uh, the other thing about with our regular season for next year, because believe it or not, the finals won't end until the third week of October. Typically, that's when we're starting our season. So if you recall, typically we'll start the latter part of October. We will not start any earlier than the beginning of December for this upcoming season. And that may even get pushed back a bit further. Our goal as a league 
is stated by Adam Silver, our commissioner, is to play 82 games with full arenas. Now, that might be a lofty goal, and we might have some in, in between within there, but that's what we're setting out to do. So it may mean that our season may start a little bit later to optimize that based on what's going on out there. The, the world is changing so so quickly as far as far as that goes. And uh, but you know, all that being said, you know, in our case, um, you know, it's also impacted as Marianne noted with the Rock and Ridge Fieldhouse. We have 200 plus ticketed events, 1,400 private events uh, a year. No, uh, Gina Vernacci, I, I saw I signed up for today too, and Gina's in the same boat we're in. The Playhouse Square being such an economic engine for our community, you know, and and uh, as we went through our discussions for the transformation with the county, they cited the fact that you know the field house is the largest driver of any venue of economic activity in Cuyahoga County, forty-eight million dollars of tax revenue, state and local a year, over three hundred million dollars of direct uh, economic impact, and uh, two two thousand jobs, and that all came to a grinding halt. You know, uh, we were. If you recall, J.B. Bickerstaff had taken over as our head coach. We had won uh, uh, five, we were five and six under his tutelage. We were turning a corner and uh, we had an amazing, we were having an incredible concert year, all the activity. And uh, basically that had just cut, came to a, a halt. So we are working diligently about reopening our venues. It seems everybody else is open, except, except for Gina and us, we're, we're, everybody else is open, restaurants, you name it. Uh, I'm on this governor's task force for large venue gathering facilities. Uh, we have a number of teams and, and <clears throat> Ohio State and uh, the PGA Tour and everybody else recommended there. Um, frankly, the governor's going to have a press conference at 2 o'clock today. I'm very interested to see what he says uh, because he did tease saying he's going to talk about sports, high school sports, college sports, pro sports. Uh, but in advance of us, uh, part of that is people, teams, everybody submits their plans for events. And right now they're for reduced capacity events. Uh, we have, uh, but in advance of us, you have sports like baseball, football, soccer, M MLS has decreed they're going to be coming back into home markets, hopefully with fans and obviously the Columbus crew and since FC Cincinnati, Cincinnati as well. And uh, we're hopeful and we've seen those plans. We're hopeful that those get blessed. When we go through these, we work with entities like the Cleveland Clinic, UH, um, and then also with the city and county, and then also with the state's Ohio Department of Health to be able to make that happen. So and I will tell you, um, our fans want to get back. We work with a, a craft advisory group and have done research and, and activity with them. And uh, they research all the comp markets that we're in. So if you look at uh, <clears throat> San Francisco or New York or Minneapolis or Orlando, whatever it may be, and what they found is people in Cleveland are, have a stronger desire and want to get back uh, into these venues at the highest level of all 30 markets. So believe it or not, so people here in Cleveland are, are dying, not dying, it's probably not a good way, are excited about getting back into the marketplace. I will tell you, uh, our ticket sales team and everyone else are having, doing incredible number of, of, of amount of business in terms of people buying ticket packages, wanting to get back, uh, part of what we're doing the same with our corporate partnership team. So there's a lot of hope out there. I think just even from the general populace of people who obviously are making investments in into our organization, expecting they're going to be coming back into the field house here in the near future. So we're really help, hopeful to do that. I will tell you, uh, we're working with a lot of third parties like the um, the Global Bio Risk Advisory Council and the Well Institute. Think of it like lead certification and they certify your buildings relative to health and wellness. Uh, we're getting ours certified at those levels. And then uh, the other thing about that, and I had this discussion with our, our, our mayor, uh, Jackson, and we were talking about our venue and about the ability to handle crowds. So we have 900,000 square feet. We have the largest amount of public square footage of any comparable arena in our league. So when you think about now with the transformed uh, field house, the ingress and egress, the atrium, being able to process people in the amount of space. So we can do that with social distancing and otherwise. We'll have a contactless venue. We'll have a, a cashless venue in terms of what's taking place. We have incredible air handling systems, systems, processes, protocols. We're making investments in infrastructure and CapEx. So as we talked about it is there's really, our building is as well positioned as any building in, in Northeast Ohio, in Ohio, and frankly, within our country to handle people. 
and, and do it safely when you think about all the other venues you walk into from a restaurant or otherwise on that realm. So we're really hopeful as we work through that process that we'll be able to create a, a safe environment as well. And right now we're actually hosting a number of what we call, we're like Cleveland's Community Center. Tony, you're very familiar with those. But in our case, we've been having clinics with the Cavs, with the Monsters. We had a cornhole tournament. This past weekend, we had a garage sale. We actually have a Wine and Gold United, our, our, our membership platform, uh, movie, movie uh, night coming up. And we've been doing those successfully. We just wanted to do it so we got people back in the building, knowing that it's safe and knowing it could be a great place. And um, on top of that, uh, as we work through all of this, and when I talk about that document that we're working on even with the governor's office, to give you an idea of it, it'll be over 100 pages. And it'll go through every aspect from the time you leave your home to the time you leave the building. So um, hopefully a lot to happen there. Another key component of what happened, obviously, during all of this, during the pandemic, was uh, it, what's happened is historic social unrest in terms of George, George Floyd's murder prom, uh, prompting protests and outcries all over the world. And it's really given hope to many that this is really a movement, not a moment. And as, as our commissioner, Adam Silver, said, we're in a unique position to, to lead uh, here with our platform down here already in, our, uh, our, uh, in Orlando with our league and our players have used the season restart as a platform and a voice for social justice. Last Friday, our owners approved the first ever NBA foundation in partnership with the NBA Players Association to support black communities and drive generational change. It's funded by the teams with a commitment of $300 million to start. And we also have other partners who will be contributing to that. And the focus will be on economic empowerment, targeting three critical employment transition points. So obtaining a job, when you think there, securing employment after high school or college, and, and then all advancement once employed. And, and really the, the league took the tact is we have these 30 amazing entrepreneurs, like our own Dan Gilbert, who Dan, just coming off of the IPO, which is unbelievable accomplishment for Rocket Mortgage, um, which, and, and Dan, in terms of what he does, in terms of believing of doing well by doing good and for more than profit. But how do we harness these amazing entrepreneurs, Steve Ballmer from Microsoft, Ted Leonsis, who founded AOL, and use that as a platform for economic empowerment. And so we're really laser focused on that as well. We also, are, um, I'm down here, I mentioned with Kobe Altman, our GM. We are one of two teams in the NBA and professional sports for that matter, who have a bull black uh, general manager, in our case, Kobe Altman, and a black head coach in J.B. Bickerstaff. They have led in this cause. So they, they stepped up right away, and they've been leaning in. They're working collaboratively with uh, Chris Antonetti along of the, of the Indians, along with Andrew Berry of the Browns. You'll hear some more news on that. Our first, first step forward is to be a voting site. So we announced it this morning. Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse will be a voting site for Ward 3. Uh, and uh, in, in addition to that, we'll also have an event on National Voter Registration Day on September 22nd. News to come about that as well. And we're out to just promote voting. You know, th that you're right. And, uh, and, and we're trying to get the community, help the community get engaged. We're working with County Executive Butish on that, along with the mayor, in terms of being able to help make that happen as well. And then, you know, the other component, we uh, have had extensive discussions with our County Executive and both the city and county declared uh, racism as a public health crisis, had a resolution. Uh, we've been working in terms of programs that we're activating and lining it up with the city and county about how we can amplify on that and work off of that as well. And so it's been, you know, uh, I think uh, amazing about how the community has come together on that front. Uh, we're working with our sports partners to be able to help make, a, you know, a greater impact as far as, you know, as far as that goes. Uh, but you know, we are uh, extremely op optimistic in the future, you know, relative to our ability to get back to business, ultimately reopening the field house and engagement with our fans overall. But beyond that, you know, I think we are even more excited about being able to be a, an, a, an agent of social change. Uh, again, like I said, we feel like we're uniquely positioned within our, our league. We are a you know, a, a flashpoint for our community. We know we have a, a responsibility uh, within our community, the stewardship of the franchise, but also what the field house represents to so many people as a point of connection. Uh, as, as, you know, Marianne, as you referenced, you know, we had 1.3 million people turn out for the parade. 
uh, here when, when we were able to fortunately bring home the championship, which was, is still the largest um, uh, fan celebration in the history of our league. And at the time it happened was the sixth largest ever in the history of professional sports globally. Uh, so that just gives you an idea of how uh, sports can uniquely connect communities, bring people together, unlike anything else. So we were really excited about that. And then one last thing I'll touch on, because I really want to engage as far as questions here too, is we're really excited about downtown and what's happening there and in our neighborhoods and in, in Cleveland as a whole. Uh, and so when I, I, I talk, you know, I'm, I'm heavily engaged as well, as Marianne mentioned with Jack, but also with Bedrock and working with QL, Quicken Loans. So I will tell you, Bedrock right now is one of the largest commercial real estate holders, which is Dan's real estate development arm. We just opened the May Company building, which we're so proud of. That was a dark black hole in, on, on Public Square for over 20 years. If you haven't had a chance, it's open for tours. Get down there. It is spectacular. The homage they paid to the historical detail, but bringing it back to life is amazing. We're working right now, as you know, on the City Block project with Bernie Marino and John Penny and others to bring back uh, uh, you know, uh, the avenue of shops and how we can make that an entrepreneurial hub as well. And then uh, with Rocket Mortgage, you know, people don't re realize this. They're hiring 50 people a month at, uh, with Rocket Mortgage at the Higby Building. And Adam Speck, who's our, our, uh, our, who leads that office for us with Quicken Loans, is doing an amazing job. So if you know anybody looking for a job, you know, I would point them to Rocket Mortgage Downtown, hiring great jobs in downtown Cleveland. And we're really excited about the future and what that, what that holds. This will be a, you know, a moment in time that we will make us stronger as a city, will make us stronger as an organization. And, uh, and as Dan tells us every day, you know, we're, uh, there's an incredible amount of opportunity. And why should the East Coast and West Coast have all the fun? And, you know, let's, let's make it happen here in Cleveland and Detroit. Len, thank you so much for sharing all of the work that you and the organization have done um, in such a small amount of time as well. We do have a few questions, and for those on the call, if you have a question, please put them in the chat box. To start, your organization is has gained a lot of um, greater recognition for the work on issues arising out of racism and promoting diversity, inclusion, and equity. How did you move so quickly in this space, and how do you make this a permanent part of your culture? You know, that's a thank you. Uh, thanks for that question. And I'm, I'm, I'm remiss in saying this as well. So uh, we have uh, probably about four years ago, we made the conscious decision that, um, you know, that we wanted to have at a senior level, senior, a vice president level, a, uh, a leader within our diversity and inclusion efforts to lead that on a day to day basis. And uh, we became the fourth team in the NBA, the fifth in major professional sports to bring on a leader who really could help us really, first of all, you know, we had been doing it episodically within, it's, it's always been uh, first and foremost within our organization. Uh, I, I'll tell you this, so we have a measurement within major professional sports. The NBA has always finished the highest in terms of what they call the DNI scorecard. And our team had been amongst it in the top tier as far as that goes, but it wasn't enough because it wasn't sustained on a daily basis and, and threaded throughout the entirety of the organization. Kevin Clayton, and Kevin used to actually head up DNI efforts at the United States Tennis Association, most recently at Mercy Health Systems out of Cincinnati, and he's been absolutely spectacular. Corey James is part of that team as well, and uh, so he's our Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion as well as Community Engagement, has more deeply connected us with partners like the NAACP, with Marsha Maccabee at the Urban League, Daniel Sidnor, obviously NAACP, many others throughout the community, and, uh, and now is working closely with uh, Kobe, JB, the entirety of our team. So when this all happened, you know, we, we started to step back and actually had an internal conversation. I, I mean, the, the, and what came out of that, it really gave, um, I think, all of our team members uh, an, an incredible amount, a whole new perspective of the depth and the, the daily impact with our, our Black team members that they, they live through on a daily basis uh, that, you know, that had relatively been silent. And, um, and so with that, I think it's energized the entirety of our organization. I know it's energized the entirety of our organization, but it's one of the things we've talked about with our league, really making that investment to have someone lead and make it, and not just make it an adjunct of HR or some other area, but having someone who's focused on it 365, 24 seven, 
makes a huge difference and has put us in a position of strength uh, to be able to hopefully make an a true sustained impact here. So you mentioned many of the community events that you've been able to host so far. And in the chat box, there's been some um, wonderful comments about opening up to the Red Cross for blood donations. How did you make the decision to turn to these type of events and make them happen so quickly in a short amount of time? Well, um, again, a, a, great, a great question there. And uh, as, as we know, we've had anything but normalcy here. And there's nothing that's more painful then coming to the field house or driving by it and just seeing it dark and dormant, right? I mean, it's here you have this engine. And by the way, you know, we have so many great partners downtown, the restaurateurs, the hoteliers. I mean, they're hurting right now. They are absolutely hurting. And so as much as we're working to drive to get back in business for our 2000 team members, you know, we're well, going back to what the county said about this economic engine and, and what it does in terms of the, uh, the impact as big of a driver as anything, not to mention the intangibles, the spotlight it puts on the community. And so we really, what we wanted to do was, and, and again, these are huge, significant documents that we have process with the Cleveland Clinic and they approve every aspect of it to make sure our team members are safe, participants are safe, work with the city, county, and then by the state health department, and then by the, ultimately the governor's office approving these. So that's the process we go through for these. And, uh, but we wanted to get activity back in our building. We wanted to get people back in to know it's safe. It's a great environment that this hulking 900,000 square foot structure isn't just gonna sit for months dormant. And, and we're, so any way that we can, and we're also now starting to book for events. And I, I applaud groups like the Music Box Supper Club and others who are out very actively, um, you know, uh, booking events and other activities. And I've you know, talked to many of them as they've started to re-engage and re-emerge as far as that goes, our hoteliers, others. And so we're working to really set the table so we have that type of activity that's going on. And then how can we be a community conduit? I know uh, Mike Parks, who's an amazing leader uh, with the Red, Red Cross, and we're blessed to have Mike leading the charge there. And we've partnered with Mike and his team. We've been, um, you know, we, we heard when talking with the Red Cross, they had, you know, there were certain areas that just didn't want to have blood drives because of various concerns. And what better place than the field house within the atrium? And we've had incredible turnouts, great results, and look to continue to have those as well. So anything where we can get people in the building, having a great experience, sort of breaking down those barriers again. And even when we have these events that we're petitioning, we are petitioning ultimately here for in the late fall, hopefully for a ticketed event with reduced capacity. But even getting people in at a reduced capacity breeds confidence that it isn't so bad. They see the protocols, they see how we're uh, creating in a safe environment and, and ultimately can breed more confidence for, you know, getting more people back in the building, you know, as, you know, hopefully treatments and ultimately a vaccine occurs. So what advice would you give other sports, specifically NFL and MLB, for returning to play? Well, I would just say this. So, um, you know, right now, the, the Browns and the Bengals and, uh, and then also, uh, obviously, with the, the Browns and the Columbus crew, uh, knowing and, and they're all on the, we're all on the committee together. Um, I, I had a chance to even see some of their efforts. We all share. You know, this is all about sharing at this point. You know, that's what is hopefully going to lead to a vaccine more quickly. We heard Dr. Tom Mahaljevic say, at what other point do we have one to 200 million scientists focus on the same thing and sharing information. It's unprecedented as far as that happens. And that's what's going on in our industry. The amount of sharing globally to get to the right place, and I will tell you uh, the plans that they have undertaken, the protocols, the systems they're putting in place, have me incredibly confident just as a fan. So I'm looking forward to being in First Energy Stadium for a Browns game. You know, the same, I know they have the Columbus crew coming back here shortly. You know, obviously the Indians are playing now, the Reds are playing now, you know, the point in time here where they can safely get fans in. We have large enough venues where social distancing can be accomplished. You know, obviously we have, you know, uh, protocols like masks and other, other ends, you know, going contactless, uh, you know, paperless, uh, uh, cashless, all these things help make it safer as you go through. So uh, I will tell you that 
the, the, the efforts that they've undertaken have been Herculean as well. And, uh, I, and, and we're, we're rooting for them because we're behind them. Uh, the way our schedule falls is behind them and they're gonna help pave the road for all of us, all the venues and you know, also rooting for uh, you know, Gina and Playhouse Square you know, just an amazing engine for our community. And, you know, we have to get back to find a way to get back to, we can't, you know, it's sort of, it's tough because it's tough to pick winners and losers, right? And so when you look at uh, uh, retail establishments and hospitality establishments, the other uh, areas that are open, uh, we feel our venues are able to handle people as well, if not better than many of those. And we just asked for a fair hearing to be able to illustrate exactly how we do that. And that's how all of us are approaching this. And again, a great credit to all those respective ownership and leadership teams with uh, our fellow sports franchises. So we have time for one more question. Um, as you look back over the past few months, what has surprised you most about this experience? You know, uh, I would say that, that what has surprised me the most is, and I'm, I'm going back to March 11th, okay, when, uh, when well, the drum beat had started to happen. Uh, I, I, first of all, I, you never, in, you know, and I have a lot of people ask me this, so I've been in this business for a long time. We've never had a, 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 a triple impact like this, right? We've had a pandemic, a time of historic social unrest, and a historical collapse of our economy. Um, all, all at the same time. I mean, you cannot, it's, 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 and so, but, but I think the thing about that, which is just gives us all hope is the amazing resiliency of the American people and the drive, the determination to find a way. Uh, I, I think the blessing that's going to come out of all, all this is one, the innovation, the acceleration of innovation, which is gonna be in, as disruptive right now in our league we're looking at everything, everything's on the table. All the stuff we couldn't do now, everything's on the table. So the amount of innovation that's gonna spawn out of this is absolutely gonna be stunning. And then I think relative to, you know, relative to the, uh, um, the, the movement towards social justice, I think it will be a movement and not a moment. I think it's created and, and touched uh, so deeply that that's been a dialogue I know within our league, within our team, but also within the community is how do we make this sustainable? Hence, the foundation really focused on economic empowerment. Uh, that's what we have heard, you know, from the community is how do we create opportunities for wealth generation, for people to be able to have, have means to be able to make an impact in the world. And, and it doesn't, pull, it doesn't uh, supplant other uh, efforts as well, but how do we harness the, the uh, platform that we do have to make change? So uh, as you know, it's always darkest before dawn, right? You know, is what they say, and one foot in front of the other. And I, we've, we've been hitting all these body blows, but coming out of it, I think we will be stronger than ever as a country and as a people. Well, Len, I thank you for your time today. And I'm going to quote Mike Parks here from the chat box and say, you guys have rocked. Thank you so much. And we absolutely look forward to when we can gather again for big events at the Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse. And thank you for all that you have done.